Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Hollywood and History. We have a guest today that I'm very excited to that she's chosen to join us. Uh, it was about two years ago I first met um, today's guest at her home, actually, in Massachusetts. She was kind enough to, to let Armin and I come and visit her. And she and I have been communicating back and forth over, uh, over that time. But this is the first time I've actually gotten to see her again face to face over Zoom. Uh, but I'll let I'll let Armin do the formal introduction. Go ahead, Armin. Thanks, Michael. So today we have on Marianne Mesropian McCurdy. She is a retired professor and former chair of the Department of Writing at Ithaca College and is currently a visiting professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Professor McCurdy received her MA in British Literature and her PhD in Humanities from Syracuse University. Her field of study is composition theory, and she taught at Ithaca College for 23 years, nine of which as chairs the Department of Writing before moving to Hampshire College. She has published many scholarly articles, personal essays, and poetry, and her most recent work was published by Transaction Publishers in February 2015, titled Sacred Justice, The Voices and Legacy of the Armenian Operation Nemesis, a cross-genre book that includes both original documentation and memoir, to tell the story of the operation to assassinate the Ottoman Turkish leaders who were the architects of the Armenian Genocide. Professor McCurdy, thank you very much for accepting your invitation to appear on today. I think all Armenians, as we were talking about it just a, a little bit earlier, are reeling and coming to grips with the most recent developments in Nagorno-Karabakh, and perhaps we can touch on that subject toward the end of our segment. But let us perhaps begin on a somewhat lighter note. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into your field and also your family origins. Sure. Well, first, um, let me make one correction. I'm at UMass Amherst now. I went to Hampshire for a while and then I moved to UMass Amherst. So I'm at, I'm at UMass Amherst now. Um, in terms of how I got into this, well, I ended up, as it turned out, being the granddaughter of one of the members of our Christian nemesis. We did not know this growing up. Nobody knew it. My grandfather could keep a secret, and he did. Files were, however, stored in a file cabinet in the bedroom that I slept in as a child. After he died, um, they, they just stayed there for another 20 years until my grandmother died, or more than that, actually. He died in 1964, and my grandmother died in 1990. And in 1990, we were going through the house to prepare it for sale and discovered this folder of papers. I say we, it's my, my mother made the discovery initially and called me up and said, you gotta come see this stuff. <laughs> like we couldn't believe it, what we were looking at. We had no clue. I don't think his wife even knew, nobody knew. But it explains this constant parade of very important po politicians and dignitaries that used to pour through our house um, fre fairly frequently when I was growing up. These were people like General Dro that were best buds with my grandfather. I never could, you know, I never even asked why that would be, have been the case. I thought he was amazing. So I figured everybody else did too. But growing up, you get a very different picture, I think, of, of your elders than you, than you do when you're grown up already. So we started looking through these materials and made shocking and fantastic discoveries that my grandfather, it turned out, was the finance officer, one of the three leaders of Operation Nemesis. His job was logistics, making sure that everything was planned properly, that there was money behind it, that it was going to work, and to um, keep keep tabs on all the different factions, the, the different groups that were out there doing this stuff, because it, it could get pretty chaotic and pretty difficult. So he was the logician, you know, the, the guy that logistics person, the guy who was supposed to make sure this all happened and to figure out how to make how to create the financial wealth that would make it happen. Because of course the Armenians were at that time destitute almost everywhere they were, they didn't have much money. So I have no idea how we raised it. I really don't. The only thing I can tell you is in the file, we saw listings of different Armenian communities that were attached to churches often. And they were all over the place. They were Guelph, you know, they were up in Ontario, Hamilton, um, Chicago, New York, Boston, lots of different places. I don't know ultimately, you know, who contributed. I just had a, a, an amount that was sent by these different communities. So that's how we found out about this. Okay, I was wondering if you could tell us what was it like to grow up as an Armenian in, is it in central Massachusetts or? Uh... Well, I grew up in Syracuse, New York. Oh, in upstate New York. Which mm -hmm. is, shall we say, 
less cosmopolitan even than the Amherst area in Massachusetts. Central New York is a larger city, um, somewhere around over 200,000 people. But growing up, I've been asked if I'm East Indian, West Indian, um, Jewish, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, um, even Irish once. And that, that was the big surprise. <laughs> Somebody asked me if I was Irish. And it, actually I was, I was singing in a, um, in a nightclub at the time, um, a nightclub sort of a gig that I had. I, I'm a singer also. And uh, this woman came up to me and she said, my dear, you're so small, which I am. And she said, are you by any chance Irish? And I said, no, 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 I'm not Irish. <laughs> and, and, and I said, why did you ask that? And she said, well, you know, you're so small like those leprechauns. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's how far away from Plum I was in terms of people getting some idea of, of who the Armenians were. That's how, I, I won't say buried, but how, how hidden we were in the community we were in. Uh, however, the Syracuse community was, Oddly enough, big enough to have two churches, as you probably, some, many of you know, the Armenian church was split in half and it was a political problem as, as much as it was a geographical problem. But initially it was geographical because um, the Etchmadzin church was you know, in Armenia and there were so many Armenians in Cilicia and they wanted to have a, a Gatavigos there that they could, they could rely on. So the, the church allowed that. But um, after, the, um, a lot of other things happened. Um, that's the split in the church became political as well as uh, geographical. And, and the Gatavigos church, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the, um, the Cilician church became associated with the RF and the Echmianzin church was associated with Ramgabars and, and other political groupings. So there was a split, unfortunately, in the Armenian community and it had to do with how to respond to this cataclysmic event, the genocide. They could not agree. Um, this is not uncommon. A lot of groups end up in all kinds of having all kinds of stress that's related to differences of opinion about how best to handle what is absolutely a horrible situation. That's what happened to the Armenians. Um, my grandmother railed against this all her life. She she stood up once and many times actually and made a speech saying, you know, our, our language is one, our church is one, our, our, our hearts are one, why cannot we be one, you know? Um, why cannot we be a united Armenia? And, and this is something that she said in 1990, in May of 1990, when she was awarded the um, honorary title of um, mother of the year by the Armenian prelacy. And she stood up at the age of 99, it might've been a hundred, we're not sure. <laughs> officially it was 98 but unofficially I think it, she made it to 100 because we've seen a uh, church bible that seemed to a family bible that seemed to indicate that she made it to 100 so at 100 there she was you know with her her arm raised <laughs> why can't we all be one <laughs> so um he my my grandfather married the the right spouse let me tell you she's a tough lady <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, were you guys growing up? Were you guys encouraged to pronounce that identity uh, in this, you know, a very? Uh, I, I suppose until the nineteen sixties, people weren't really too intent on telling everybody what their ethnic identity was. Right, there was more of this pressure to assimilate or not appear to be too different. And was that the the case in growing up in upstate New York? You know. I was so much a part of that community that in some ways being an Odar, you know, non-Armenian felt weird. And it, it isn't that I didn't have friends or didn't, didn't feel like I, I belonged, although there was a part of me that didn't really feel like I belonged. I mean, it was, it's, it's a split life. It's a very strange kind of, of dynamic because on the one hand, there are all these people that you know that if your car broke down, you could pick up the phone and call any one of 10 families, right? And somebody will come and get you. You don't know them all that well, though. It's not like you you share your innermost thoughts and feelings and experiences with them, but they're still part of this larger family. Um, and you don't feel that way necessarily about Odars. And I use that term because all it means is other. And um, that's, that's how it felt to be other. We felt other. We felt like we, we were a part of the community, but not exactly a part of the community. Very difficult to explain. I'm sure if you, it, it, when you're listening to the rhetoric that's going on now about 
minorities and, and their sense of, of where they belong in the community. If you can imagine that, you know, transpose back several decades and imagine there's no language about it. There's no talking about it. There's no one it's coming to and asking you about this. It was very strange, a very odd thing, odd experience. And did that by any chance inspire you to pursue the, the professional uh, career that you did? Uh, I mean, of course, you know, we can choose any number of uh, paths, but uh, why did you decide to go into literature? Well, I first went into singing. Uh, my oh. first jobs when I graduated from, from college were as a singer, as a professional singer. And um, I was trained primarily in classical, but you, it's very difficult if you're a lyric culture to do, uh, unless you have a voice that's big enough to fill a hall that's size of, of, a, of a, a large, you know, place to, to land an airplane because, um, and I don't, um, it's a, I have a light voice. Um, it's a high voice and a light voice and I can project it, but my, my projection does not, isn't, doesn't, would not fill the mat. Um, and so if you can't fill the mat, um, they started building these halls bigger and bigger and bigger to bring in more people because it's very difficult to make any money selling classical music. Um, I decided that I would, try my hand at, at um, you know, singing in, in, a, in a kind of a, a band, I guess you could say, but we did a lot of really lovely stuff. So it wasn't, I wasn't shrieking and I didn't, you know, mess up my voice. But um, after a while, uh, it got harder and harder and, and it got harder and harder for all kinds of strange reasons. Like, um, first of all, you have kids and then that gets, it makes it a lot harder. But on top of that, um, singing in a nightclub is difficult because people get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and they were smoking a lot. And then the, all kinds of nasty comments come up, you know, things that we, you, men should not say to women. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you what those were now on the, you know, um, but you can imagine. And so one night I was singing in, in a place and, and I knew the owner and it was a really upscale place, very upscale, very lovely place. And this guy gets drunk and of course he hauls out. And of course the owner goes out and he grabs him and says, you know, you speak like that again and you're out the door. But I, I just, I had had it. I just had it. So at that point, I thought, all right, I want to sing where people aren't drinking, aren't smoking, and aren't making nasty lewd comments, right? Um, and the only place you can go in a case like that, <laughs> where you're not going to get the lewd comments, you're not going to get the drinking, and you're not going to get you know smoke blown in your face, is classical music. So I started going. I went back to my first love, and what I decided to do was sing semi-professionally, and that's what I did. So that means I needed another career, and um, I had. I had followed in my mother's footsteps in one important way. Um, I had spent some time, it was when I was in college, working as an editor at Syracuse University Press where my mother was, a, was the executive editor and then ultimately the director. And um, so I, I, I honed my skills as an editor, but um, I just found myself gravitating to language. And the only way I could do anything with that at the time was to major in English. So I did that. When you, get out of college, what do you do when you major in English? You go sing in nightclubs, right? And when you don't do that anymore, then you have to go back to school. And that was what took me into grad school. And as I studied literature, I realized that it wasn't the literature I loved so much. It was, it was teaching. It was the process of working with other minds, other, other, other hearts, other, other sentient feeling beings and helping them to learn things and to grow and to, and to become um, the people that they wanted to be. So um, I ended up uh, finding uh, finding writing as, as the subject that I wanted to teach because it's, for me, it's one of the best ways that people can process information. Um, and, and, and while doing that, of course, I was doing my, my other work and part of that other work was, you know, my own writing. I did some poetry at the time. I did some other kinds of essays and little by little I came coming, I came back to this question of trauma. Um, what is trauma? And it, by that time, by 1980, there was an actual diagnosis that could be made of PTSD. Before that, there was no such thing. So in World War II, for example, you had um, over a couple hundred, 200 to 250 years, so soldiers shot at the British for, quote, cowardice, because they were suffering from PTSD. And with World War I, they called it shell shock. But nobody wanted to admit it because it made war very complicated. And how do you take care of your troops if you have troops that you then have to designate as suffering from PTSD and you don't want them back in the battle because they may not be reliable. So um, that, that became a problem. 
but um, after that period, it was very interesting convergence between uh, um, veterans groups after the, Viet the Vietnam War and women's groups that had ultimately decided they'd had enough of sexual abuse. It, it was enough and they wanted to, to do something about it. And they wanted, first of all, they wanted treatment that was available and they wanted to um, raise the, the flag of understanding about this. And then those two groups started talking to each other. And in the process of talking to each other and comparing notes, they found that the trauma that one group had was very similar to the trauma that the other group had, uh, groups of individuals. And, um, and then of course, the professionals got involved, people like Judith Herman um, and ultimately Bessel van der Kolk, who spend, has, has spent their careers dealing with this question of trauma. And when those moments came together, then there was a diagnosis that could be reimbursed through insurance companies and that was PTSD and that was 1980. So right about that time was when I got my, my, my PhD. And I was very interested in this because I was interested in how writing can be used to move somebody beyond a traumatic experience? How, how is it that we can write about such an experience and, and it changes the way we feel about that experience just from writing about it? So that's the, um, I started teaching a lot of personal essay courses and that evolved into teaching courses on using writing for this um, therapeutic benefit. Um, it's a tricky thing because I'm not working in the area of mental health, I'm working in the area of writing. But the very things that we ask people to do to make to, to help their writing get better are the very things that one would be asking someone to do to help themselves get better. So in just asking my students to write better, which is to provide details, um, a clarity with, with respect to those details. So you want them to have a visual sensory, sensory clarity. In the process of getting that clarity, people get a very different sense of what their experience was about. They begin to own it. In the process of owning it, not only does their writing get better, but they get better. So. Um, now that's what I'm teaching at UMass Amherst. This is a course that's called Narrative Medicine, How Writing Can Heal. And so I've, I come at it through the writing side, not through the therapeutic side, but, but I'm meeting people that are coming at it through the therapeutic side and the medical side. And we join together in, um, in certain kinds of programs. There's one down at Columbia. They use my stuff. I use theirs. Um, Columbia Medical School has a program in narrative medicine and they're absolutely wonderful at it. They do a great job. And we put together a conference that, that looked at this in 2000, I think it was seven in Toronto. So people from Columbia came and we came and other people came, this guy who's been doing a lot of work, um, his name is James Pennebaker and he's at Austin. He came up because he's been working with, um, through the, through the uh, experimental psychology unit. Um, he's been bringing students into his labs and saying, sit down and write about the worst experience that, I, that you ever ha ha had in your life for 20 minutes. And, um, and they do that. And then he's followed them um, and discovered that their blood markers for illness have improved immensely. Their, that is to say, um, their antibodies have, 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 have strengthened. So they're less likely to get sick. And so, so we're looking at the physical stuff, we're looking at the emotional stuff, and we're looking at, at the, how it affects people's writing. So it's, it's an interesting field now, and I think it's, it will only grow. I don't, I don't normally interrupt, but I need to chime in here because as you're talking about like the therapeutic aspect of writing, um, Sogol Muntalerian was yes. given, after three weeks sitting in jail, he was finally given like 10 sheets of blank paper and a pencil. And he describes it that he lunged at it like he they gave him a cup of coffee and uh, writing implements. And he describes grabbing the paper and writing and completely forgetting about the, the coffee. Like so he's been sitting there for three weeks processing what just happened without being able without an outlet. And then he just writes it and it became his prison diary. So it's absolutely classic. <laughs> That's what you look for. Yeah. That's what you look for. Thank you for 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 telling that story. Very good one to, to remember, especially yeah. given what we're talking about. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 No, no, I personally find that very fascinating what you mentioned, Marion, because I can personally attest to uh, its value as well in terms of just putting down your thoughts into word. I, 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 without going off too much on a tangent, do you think it's because it is the story we tell ourselves and how we can also compare what we may have written, say, six months ago to now and um, infer a, an evolution of sorts of our uh, evolve evolving of our thinking um 
there are a, a lot of things you could say about this process, but let me just say one very quick thing about it. Um, it has a neurobiological base. So, you know, the brain has all kinds of different parts that do different things. And what happens with trauma is that the images, the traumatic images can, be, can become locked into the part of the brain that is nonverbal. And when that happens, there's very little that anyone can do to go get that stuff until you start translating it into language. And this mm -hmm. can only be done with intentionality. You have, to, you have to make it a point to do it because it's not instinctive. Somebody's not gonna say, you know, give me that pad of paper, you know? Um, but when actually Bessel van der Kolk did some research on this, he brought in Vietnam War veterans and he had them put them in an MRI machine. And then he, um, he it was an MRI, I think it was, he was MRI. Um, and he asked them to recount the narrative in their head. And what he found at that time was that Broca's area kind of woke up. It had been asleep before. Broca's area is the area that, that handles language. And so, um, particularly verbal language. Um, and so what, what happened was that even using their verbal skills started putting, putting words to these images that they had. And in the process of doing that, the, they get moved to the part of the brain that can actually do something about this, the part of the brain that can write. And that's the left brain. So the right brain is where the images are, but the left brain is, is where, where language is. And so it, it, it's, a, it's like a transfer. And it, it feels like that when people are in the midst of that moment. It feels like, uh, you know, like something is different, right? So um, in the process of, of doing that, um, you, can, you can actually then start making meaning out of these experiences instead of having them feel like, you know, total chaos. Now, emotionally, they can still be compelling and still be upsetting. And it's not like a panacea. No, no. But, but at least things start to make a little sense instead of being this mess of, of, of picture and, uh, and sound and image and, you know, all that, you know, that doesn't seem to coalesce. Language helps to pull stuff together. Yeah, and you know, this conversation is also very reminiscent of the interview that Michael and I did with Dr. Pamela Steiner, who I believe you you guys know one another. And because she was uh, talking about this subject as well, or more precisely on trauma and how its mechanisms function and the impact it does leave on, on us human beings. And it's very interesting to see how there's these therapeutic ways, which perhaps are not as instinctual. We may not necessarily think of writing as the, an, an outlet or a, a sort of treatment, if that's, if that's the appropriate way of putting it, to allow people to process and make sense of some terrible things or episodes they may have experienced in their past. And maybe I can use that as a segue to your most recent book project and ask, was there, some sort of trauma that, well, again, uh, if it's if I'm not wearing that correctly, please uh, let me know. Was your family's background or the, the Armenian genocide something which weighed heavily on you and which you felt that you could find an outlet to talk about or make sense of or um, ascribe importance to by writing about it and ultimately in this book that was published in 2015? To talk about that, I'm going to have to talk a little bit about intergenerational trauma, um, because it isn't so much that there's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's that people internalize their experiences, and and those experiences, when they're different, will will have different results. And I saw that with my family. So on the one hand, you know, here's Eliza and Aaron, resistors, right? And they were able to resist. They could do that given the situation they were in and, and their temperaments and, and probably also their families because um, resistance doesn't always win. You know, sometimes you get dead and, and that's what happened to Elise's brother. Um, you know, he was, Miran was the, was the primary resistor in that family and he got killed. Um, and that's, now that was a tragic moment for the family. So it's not that resistance wins all the time, it doesn't, but something else happens inside when people resist, even if they lose. They don't lose on the inside. They, there's something that they retain. And um, 
on my father's side, they could not resist. His mother ran to the American mission in um, 1894 or five when their village was overrun. And the father ran into the woods and escaped and came to the United States and they were separated for 10 years. His mother and father had the imprint of trauma on them. I can tell by the way my father talks about them, talked about them. And I can tell by the way my father internalized his responses to them. Very different experience from my mother's side. Now, resistance doesn't always give you, you know, warm and fuzzy either. My mother's side of the family, they were tough people. Um, you know, there were no, you know, oh, here, come here, kid, and I'll, I'll cuddle you while you're crying, you know? No, just, no it's a stand up, get started, get going, you know, let's get to it. <laughs> it was, it, you know, I mean, that was kind of the way they operated. And um, so I'm, I'm looking at this bifurcated version of reality growing up and thinking, this is really interesting. <laughs> And as a kid, you don't have words for it. You just know that it's different, right? You just know. My father and my mother deal very differently with stuff. Okay, what am I going to do about this? Um, nothing. You can't fix it. All you can do is adjust. So, you know, that's the, that's the, when you ask me, you know, what was your family's response? It, it was multiple. You know, there are two responses. And, and then, of course, each individual has their own interpretation of these responses. So, you know, you, you have who you are and you have the way who you are um, and what you've inherited from your family uh, interacts with then your environment, which is different from the environment your parents grew up in. So, you know, it's complicated, very complicated. It, it, in order to think about this, you have to pull, pull it all together, right? You have to start thinking from the, the broadest viewpoint you can and say, what are the possible responses to trauma? What are they like? What does trauma do? And then you start looking for behaviors that demonstrate some of these things and try to get some sense of, all right, how, how do we then um, intervene in the, with these behaviors if indeed there's some that you want to change, that you want to do something about? So um, I found myself, you know, and I was first thinking about writing Sacred Justice because I knew I had to tell the story. My mother basically handed me the stuff. Now, my mother was a a, a supremely good writer. She wrote a, a fantastic book on the, the Armenians in Syracuse, New York, published by Gomitas, um, who, by the way, is, is publishing my, my Elisa, my grandmother, Aaron's wife's memoir that I'm just putting together now. So, um, but she handed me this project, basically. I, I, I could never quite figure out why she didn't leap into it. I don't know. I mean, she did some summaries of each of the letters, but at that point, she put them in the basement and the basement flooded twice. And, you know, I said, when I got the letters, I had to peel them apart, you know, piece by piece, put them on the table, let them dry out. It was bizarre. I mean, they had stuck together. I think they were dry by then. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I think that I, I, I don't know. I don't I don't know whether it was getting older because by then she was in her 80s. Or if it was 80s, 90s, maybe two, but she, this 1990 um, was 14 years before her death and she died at 91. So I don't know. I think it'd be a, a big surprise. <laughs> I'm not sure quite if that was what made her put it down for a while or ask me to basically, you know, put, put, give it to me. I don't know. But anyway, when I saw the project, I realized as I, as I was reading these letters that it wasn't only about Nemesis, it was also about the Armenians and how the Armenians responded to, to this experience and how my family was in many ways a, um, a, a, a classic example of, of, the, of the ways, at least two of the ways that one can respond to what it, to the historical reality that faced the, that the Armenians had to face. And in the process of doing that, I realized that, uh oh, now I have to do something that's beyond writing history. I now have to do a, a multi genre book. So it has to be a book that, that yes, it, it's historical, but it's, it's also um, personal, it's also um, scholarly, because I, now I'm going to have to give information about 
history, about trauma, about um, I mean, families, re current research, etc. So it, it, it became a multi-genre work and, um, and negotiating that was not difficult exactly, but just, it's, it's kind of new territory. It's, um, it's something that's being done more now, but um, I, I knew that it would be, it would look a little different to some people. I don't think it has affected the reading very much because it, I'm hoping that it, it goes seamlessly back and forth from the historical stuff to the to the family stuff or to, to the you know more personal stuff to the scholarly stuff. But the reader would have to make that judgment, I guess. So you tell me. <laughs> well, I think many people who are familiar with this channel will know what Michael and I have been up to this last few years. But perhaps you can provide us with. Uh, maybe definition is not the right word, but perhaps you can tell us what exactly was Operation Nemesis and why do you think it was important? Some of these uh, questions, you know, the answers may be so self-evident, but I feel like it's interesting to ask a person who is not necessarily, say, a historian or, or uh, coming from the same field as you are to see where their perspective originates. The Armenians have had at, at it, it's, it's hard to describe how difficult life has been for the Armenians on, under the Turkish government. Um, in the 19th century, they were basically second-class citizens. They, they were not citizens, actually. I say second-class. They weren't citizens at all. Um, they were a, a subgroup. And um, whenever the Turks wanted something, they took it from the Armenians. And this meant, you know, Kurds up in the mountains, you know, coming down and, and wanting a bed, food, a woman, um, a kid, you know, they took what they took, they, what they wanted. Um, in the cities, it was a little less hairy, but as we saw in 1995, uh, 94, 96, and 1909, it got pretty bad in Cilicia and other places too. So um, it ultimately, of course, it ended in, in the genocide and um, it ended the genocide for all kinds of reasons. And I don't know if you want me to go into them here, but. Um, just very briefly, you know, Turkey had been going through its own collapse in some ways in Europe and it was basically kicked out and it came home and said, well, where are we going to get land from? Oh, Armenians, no problem. And so that was a premeditated desire to steal. And they did. Um, and they could. That was the other piece of it, that, that, that they could. Um, Talat knew this. He knew he was going to, this was a, a point of no return. Morgenthau said, why do you have to do this? He, Morgenthau was the ambassador to Turkey by, from the United States. Why do you have to do this? Why do you have to, you know, kill all these people? You know, what have they done to you? And, and he said, you know, stop it, stop it. And Talat looks at him and he says, no Armenian can ever be our friend after what we have done to them, right? Quote, unquote. So uh, Morgenthau knew that it was over and he left. He left Armenia then. He couldn't stand looking at this any longer. So, um, you know, how did it come about? Because they could. You know, that, that's a famous saying, abuser abuse because they can do it because they can get away with it, right? It isn't something that, that, that it has, a, there's an internal clock that says, oh, 10,000 people, that's enough, right? Oh, no, that's not enough. You got one city, now we got this one and this one and this one, the whole thing, right, all of it. So abusers abuse because they can get away with it. And the United States allowed them basically to get away with it. So when that happened um, and, and after the war, um, after World War I and they had tribunals, and they brought some of these Turks into the tribunals. And they were, by the way, run by the Turks themselves. At that point, there was some effort to try to get justice for the Armenians. The British had their own tribunals, but they were really nabby pamby things. They sent people off to Malta, to like a club med thing, you know, when they made when they found them guilty. It really, it really was not much of a punishment. And a couple of years later, they, they let them out, and many of them went right back into government. And so it wasn't as if, you know, there was um an effort by the British to really bring justice for the Armenians. So the only justice that they got were these tribunals, uh, Turkish tribunals. But the problem was that the three people that, that were the most responsible had escaped. Now they went ahead and had the tribunals anyway, and they were found guilty of capital crimes and sentenced to death, but they weren't there. There were other places. And so the Armenians said, okay, it's up to us. And that's why they did it. So um, it, it it's not, 
it's not un, un, understandable. One can get why they did this. These were convicted criminals who were allowed to escape and they took their money with them. Worse than that, Talat was planning coming back again to Turkey to kill the rest of the Armenians that were still there. So the Armenians had no choice, they thought. So they put together this group and they used the word terrorism. It's an unfortunate word these days because it means something other than what the Armenians meant. Terrorism um, meant at the time striking terror in the hearts of these people, you know, but terrorism today means killing innocent people to call attention to real or perceived injustices or simply to take revenge, right? That's what terrorism is today. So um, I don't use that word in the book because I don't think it describes what the Armenians did. They did want revenge, that's true. And that's the word that my grandfather often uses and what Shahan and Natalie often used. I didn't blame them for that. So um, I do use that word in the book, but um, it is there. Ultimately, it's justice. Um, and that's what the Armenians believed, that they lacked justice. And I think they were right. Now, um, how do I feel about this? I'm always asked this question, so I figure you're gonna ask it sooner or later, so I'll go right for it. How do I feel about my grandfather being basically an assassin? Well, here's the deal. Um, I understand it fully. Do I have the capacity of that sort of rage? Sure. Would I have made that choice? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm, um, I'm not exactly a pacifist because if somebody comes, tries to hurt one of my kids, believe me, I'll take the sharpest knife in the door at them, right? So it's, it's, you know, one has to be realistic about this stuff. You can't sit, sit in, a, in a cloud somewhere and say, you know, well, up in this world, you know, we don't need justice or we don't need revenge because in a, in a world in which virtually everybody you know has perished, um, it makes more sense. So do I understand it? Absolutely. And that's the closest I can get to an answer when people ask me that question. I do understand. And just for clarification, how big of a group are we even talking about? Was this something which involved- How many hundreds? people? Yeah, is it hundreds of people or a handful? Well, I can only tell you what I saw in the, in the materials that I looked at. Um, they kept this pretty small because they needed to control the narrative and control the behavior of these people. So they made sure that they could vouch for everybody that was involved in this. So I think, I don't think it was that many people. I don't, I think they were very efficient. They figured out how to do it, when to do it. And mostly they were successful. Now, they had a hundred people on their list. They didn't kill a hundred people, but they killed a lot of people. People that, the, the main ones they, they, they managed to find. And um, that's the only justice they've had. That's the other piece of this. You got to remember, that's the only justice the Armenians have had. They lost their homeland multiple times in multiple ways. All of them horrible. Multiple homelands. So... I don't, um, I don't think, I won't answer the question would you have done it because I'm not them. And I think it's, it's not a useful question, but do I understand it? As I said, yep, sure do. And I don't blame them. And, you know, that's something which I feel historians who work on the late uh, Ottoman empire don't reflect upon, at least when they, the subject is on the, the, the former leaders of the Ottoman wartime cabinet, most of these guys are eliminated by Armenians. So of course there's Talat, there's um, Jamal Pasha, who was the Ottoman uh, commander of the armies in Syria and in uh, you know, the Suez Canal campaigns. And most of these guys are taken out by Armenian operatives. And it was interesting that by the end of the war, most of them weren't very much liked by, uh, you know, the, the Ottoman peoples. They blamed them for dragging the uh, the Ottoman Empire into war, whether you know with or without justification. But it is very interesting to reflect on that how it took the activities of a very tightly organized, but really, as you were uh, describing it, small outfit to 
pinpoint and assassinate these guys with exact precision within a span of a you know just a couple years from about 1919 to about 1923 24 and maybe you can talk about it why exactly did this operation wind down did they run out of targets or was there also some sort of dissension or disagreements about who should be well there was dissension targeted. and disagreement uh, right from the start and you can understand why um you know the armenians worried about offending the west their allies they were afraid of getting into trouble you know having people not like them by the way i want i wanted to mention um in in terms of i mean my guess is that there were they were there were people who ordinarily would be against capital punishment who got engaged in this i mean mm -hmm. i for example am um i would have preferred you know the tribunals uh, but but that wasn't the question posed to me, right? The question or to them, the question posed was no justice versus killing them. Then what? That becomes the difficulty. So, um, but yes, I think um, what happened was that Turkey became more important to the United States. I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, but um, it, much more important to the United States. And in the process, of, it made it more difficult for the Armenians to gain the kind of credibility and uh, um, approval from US politicians that they needed and still continue with this process, these, these um, extra legal killings. So um, maybe it's, it's time to get into this other stuff because I, I think that at the same time, it, isn't, it wasn't only the genocide that was doing this, it was also how the West was responding to what happened that made the Armenians so frustrated and so uh, hopeless. I mean, that there was a, a sense of total abandonment. So um, as you probably know, the United States and Britain were very interested in the Middle East because of the Mosul oil. And they were very, very deeply engaged in trying to figure out how to get these lucrative, lucrative contracts with the Turks, managing the railways into what, became Iraq. Now Iraq was land given by Turkey in order to help the Brits and the Americans like them better. Basically, that's what it was. It was, it was a Brit, became a British protectorate. That's the only reason we have Iraq. It didn't exist before, right? And so here are the Armenians saying, we need land, we need our land back. And what are they doing instead? They're giving this land, called, calling, calling it Iraq and giving this land to Turkey, basically. Um, it, well, it, it, from, from Turkey it, into Iraq, but Turkey was, was managing it. Um, it, it became um, a, in their backyard, right? Um, Russia was basically given cars and cars was turned over to Turkey. So the Russians said- Former Russian imperial provinces, which the, the Soviets right. ceded they, to. They, so they made a deal. The Russians made a deal, the Turks made a deal, the US made a deal, the Brits made a deal. And all this land started moving around and none of it went to the Armenians, went to other places and other people and other countries, but not to the Armenians. So um, this got to be such a, an obvious case that um, it, was, it was clear to the British that this was, this was what was going on. There's a, a famous quote, um, about, about oil. Um, oil weighed more heavily in the negotiations than Armenian blood, quote unquote. This is some, a, a member of um, um, the British House of Lords. So um, now the US was engaged in this process as well. They wanted these contracts as well. And in one of the people that was very involved in this was a guy whose name was Colby and Chester. And he was an admiral in the, U in the U.S. Navy. And this is one of the comments that you talk about fake news. Here's an example of, you know, a, a, of fake news back during this period. The Armenians in 1915 were moved from the inhospitable regions where they were not welcome and could not actually prosper to the most delightful and fertile part of Syria, where the climate is as benign as in Florida and California, whither New York millionaires journey every year for health and recreation. This was done at great expense of money and effort. So that is a quote from this guy, Colby M. Chester, who was a former admiral, he was retired. And it's one of the reasons why in 1922 in the Smyrna fiasco. Fire. Mm -hmm. they, yes, um, set by Burning. the Turks, right? 
why the Navy was told, do not save any Armenians. And they did this for, for quite a while until finally it got so bad that they had to, they just had to, but that was why. Um, and it, it isn't only that they, that they didn't, that they, they wanted to um, make sure that they got these contracts, but they had to then um, create for themselves another narrative. And that is an example of the other narrative that they created. Um, there's another, another quote that I wanna read you, if I can find it. Secretary of State Charles Evans Hughes, had been a, he was an officer of the Standard Oil Company, right? Well, um, while he was in office, he was an officer of the Standard Oil Company. Sound familiar? Um, so um, he and Ad Admiral Mark Bristol were, were both in this process of, of trying to make sure that they got a hold of, this, of these contracts from the Turks. And so what they were trying to do was, was spread hatred of the Armenians. So here's an example of what Mark Bristol was also an anti-Semite, by the way, um, and he also hated the Greeks, wrote about the Armenians, quote, the Armenians are a race like the Jews. They have little or no national spirit and poor moral character, quote, unquote. Um, another comment that was made during the, the time when the Armenians were coming to Congress and saying, please, we, we, we need a, a country, we need a country that belongs just to us. And the, some of the comments made by congressmen at that time were, if, and one in particular was st stood out, um, an American man would never have allowed his wife, his wife to be raped as these, these Armenians do. They're feckless, they are, they're weak, they don't, they're, they're not people that we should be doing any, trying to support or help. So um, that was the narrative that, that started after the war. So up until that point, it was the starving Armenian. After that point, it was this, you know, this anti-Armenian rhetoric um, and, and true prejudice that was driven by greed, to be perfectly honest, just driven by greed. So, um, so what happened then was, as, as you read, I think you know if you read the book, is that um, in the, Treaty of Sevres, Armenia was supposed to be a separate country. It, it, it had, was, Armenia was, Armenians were given land that they, they could own. It was actually historically Armenian land. But by the time Lausanne Treaty came around, all this other swirly oil and uh, greed stuff started happening and the narrative got shifted. And now the Armenians are not supported, are not protected. And, um, and the Treaty of Lausanne, once that was, was affirmed, um, by all the all of the signers assigned and affirmed um, and passed, our means were done. They were done at that point. So that's how it happened. Um, and so when you get to back to, to Nemesis, just to give you an example of how deeply um, people like Shahan Natalie felt this mission, he had ch officially changed his name. Now Shahan was an educated guy. He'd gone to Boston University and he'd studied literature, philosophy, and theater, which I always thought was kind of interesting because I think he probably had to act all kinds of roles to do what he did in, mm. in Europe. Um, probably the United States too, actually. Um, but his, the name that he that he that he used in the U.S. In, in his official name in 1923 is is John Mahi. Um, in Armenian, John means deer, and Ma he, Ma ha, Ma Ma means death. So um, that was his his name. That was his identity. And he did not want to stop. So you're asking, you know, who wanted to stop and who didn't. He did not want to stop. But the ARF did. Um, the ARF Bureau, which was the governing body, said, We're, there's too much happening now. People are too interested in, in what Turkey can provide. We're only going to get ourselves into trouble if we keep doing this. And the trouble will be that they will hate us even more than they already do. And we don't want any more of that. So, um, and by the day, the, the dislike was moving from the Turks to others because of this desire, as I mentioned, to um, to take over the, the business end of, of Mosul oil and all of the um, infrastructure that would have been necessary to, to get the oil out. So that's what they did. So they, the Armenians said, okay, we gotta get out of this business. And by the time um, 1925 came, it was, it was pretty well done. And the letters show that. I mean, I feel like we are just moving from one depressing topic to the other, but I suppose that is a, a theme that runs like a, a red line in the course of 
modern Armenian history, and I'm sure those who study Armenian history in the medieval and ancient periods will also be able to bring up any number of tragedies that uh, they've suffered. But perhaps as a way to connect the, you know, something from the relatively recent past to today, namely what is going on in Nagorno-Karabakh, I thought I would bring up this very interesting video which was circulating online a few weeks ago, and I believe even Michael edited and added it as one of the, the videos on our channel, where it shows a young Armenian soldier singing the song called Gini Litz, which in Armenia, of course, means, you know, poor wine. And it's about Solomon Tillerian's assassination of Talat Pasha. And I think the question I wanted to ask was, why do you think Tillerian's story continues to resonate to this day? Especially among Armenians. I'm sure his story, you know, stripped of some of its context can uh, allow one to relate to it no matter what background they come from. But especially for Armenians, you still see this very strong imagery that is connected to him. This project is so improbable. I mean, think about it. It's so improbable. How could you even imagine that they could have been so successful? These guys were good. They tracked on, huh? like tracking down, you know, a, a muskrat, you know, they figured out what he smelled like. They figured out where he was going to go. These guys did a great job. So on the one hand, you know, you, you have to, you have to, to, to bow to excellence, right? You have to bow to talent. You have to bow to, to determination. You have to bow to the intelligence needed to get this thing done. So that's part of it. But also part of it is, by, by the, the improbable piece is, you know, the, the, talk about coming from behind. Um, they had nothing going for them, nothing, except their hearts and souls and spirits. They didn't have much money. They collected the money for, from people who had almost no money. I still don't understand how they did that. I don't understand it at all, but they did. What they also did do was they were careful. They didn't overplay their hands. They didn't do more than they could do. And they also were very careful in how they handled the trial. And this is, this is really important because they had to do a whole a bunch of things in this trial to get this trial right. First of all, they had to make known the plight of the Armenians in the world. They had to. They had to make it very clear to everybody how terrible their situation was. Second thing, they had to justify the acts of the Avengers. They had to say, you would have done the same thing in our shoes. You can understand why we did this. Even if you couldn't be on our shoes, you, could, you can understand it. And three, they had to raise money, tons of it. And they did. They raised money from the sales of the transcripts to both support both the Armenians in, the, in dire need and the work of the ARF. So they were able to create for themselves a narrative of this man that was the truth, even though it wasn't all the truth, right? I mean, he did not see his mother murdered, right? But did it matter? He did, it didn't matter at all, ultimately. Because his mother's still dead. His sister was still dead. And they died horribly. That's the truth. Yeah. So, I, I, don't, I don't think he had any sisters. It's just uh, oh, wait, three, it, I thought, three, three, three brothers. brothers right? I, I, I meant that. I'm, it, you're right. It's a brother. It's a brother. Yeah. I'm thinking of... Um, he, yeah, there's another one that has a sister. Okay, so... Um, but he, he did testify about seeing his sister killed so well, he did that was in the transcript it yeah, was in the so transcript. that's one of the one of the falsehoods that you're talking about that's yeah. right that's right that's right but he did lose his family um and uh, and a lot so did a lot of other people i mean armangaro lost everybody but one brother and um when he was trying to recover he went to his brother's mill and he worked basically hours and hours and hours and hours a day so that he was able to finally come back, but he never totally did. I mean, he, he died in 1923 of a heart, heart problem. Um, he died of a broken heart, he did. So this project did not save him. Um, but I think it gave a lot of Armenians some hope, hope that they were 
they would be able to at least hold their heads up then. I mean, it, it, it's a very difficult, excruciatingly painful thing to imagine everything you've ever cared about blown to bits and you couldn't lift a finger, couldn't do anything. You know, I, I, I don't wanna shock your, your audience here by giving images, but there are tons of them out there if you, if you look. And the deaths that these people suffered were unspeakable, just put it that way. That's why I'm not giving you the details right now. They were unspeakable. The details are, are part of what these people saw in their mind's eyes as they were thinking about remembering their families. So it's understandable um, why they did this. But geopolitical realities shifted and they shifted enough. So the Bureau said, gotta stop doing this. It's not gonna help us any, the, the Turks are too powerful. And so, and, and the United States is, is not gonna be behind us now. They saw the handwriting on the wall. And the handwriting on the wall happened when Lausanne, the, the Treaty of Sevres was replaced. So yeah. by Lausanne. Yeah, I just, just one other point to add to that. And this is just taking a look at these guys from a demographic profile and what you mentioned about Shahan Natali, about how he was a graduate from Boston University and even somebody like Solomon Tellerian who had not received a education at the you know at the university level uh, by the time that he enrolled in the Russian army and was serving on the front and ultimately he got himself mixed up with these guys from Operation Nemesis but this was a man who at the time was only was it four plus 14, only 18 years old when he decided to serve in the, the First World War and go through that experience over the next six years of his life. It's quite a, a formative, or it would have quite a formative impact on somebody so young and to, to witness all that. And in an age where you know the world was changing with different types of technology, and of course the First World War just being a uh, you know a complete game changer when it came to how wars would be fought and what sort of treatment civilians would be subjected to both in the Ottoman Empire, among Belgian civilians and French civilians who came under German occupation or Russian civilians who came under German or Austro-Hungarian occupation. So again, just interesting to, to take in and uh, just as a to pause for a moment and absorb, you know, allow you to absorb it. Uh, those were the questions I had Michael, with the exception of the one about movie recommendations, but I thought I would leave that one to you. I would just want to, want to add thing, add one thing about um, Edmund Gatto. Um, he he was a very smart man. I mean, he was educated. He had a doctoral degree um, in in um, physics and chemistry, I think. And um, his, I think, ultimately it. You, you know, you do your best, you do what you can do, but um, Ellie's mother, or Aaron's wife's father, died of, of, of a heart attack when his son was imprisoned. Um, he was ultimately released and he didn't die for a few more years, but, but he was heartbroken that his son might be hanged for um, trying to protect his family in Dorgio in 1909. He was not, he was shot to death by the Turks in, in Eintop, fighting them. And that was probably a better death on his end. I'm sure he felt it was because he, he chose to fight. But the fact is that you have to hold on to this. I mean, if you're asking the question, why did they do this? You just have to remember the losses and what those losses were like for these people. And, and the responsibility that was shirked by the Western powers. That's the piece that I think we have to remember and we choose not to too often, um, including the United States. The United States does not follow through on its responsibilities when it should. That was one example, but there are many others as well. So. Um, I have a few questions. Ar Armin usually saves me uh, to the end. I just have a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, what we haven't stated 
I don't think necessarily is your your grandfather's name, Aaron. You've referred to him, but the, the Aaron Sachaklian, um, and your grandmother is you're referring to her. Her name was Eliza. Eliza Dermekonian. And um, so Aaron Sachaklian, Armin Garo, and Shahan Natalie are the, the masterminds of Operation Nemesis, and in Sogolmund's uh, memoir, he recounts going to um, Boston, um, that he he gets connected with the, the team, and they, they bring him to Boston, and he meets Armin Garo. It, he doesn't mention whether he met Aaron Sertraklian or not, but I imagine he did at some point, because he was in Boston for several months. Um, and then he goes, then they send him to Berlin, where he first meets Shahan Natalie. And in the memoir, it's clear that their relationship was close and very, you know, very important. And even there are pictures in the um, Sogolmund's personal photo album of him with Shahan Natalie, except he doesn't mention Shahan by name. I have a theory about that, but I don't know uh, if you are aware of that or have a theory why Sogolmund only references uh, the other spies he was with, he uses like their code name, like Hamo and Hazo, just the abbreviation. But he doesn't mention Shahan at all by name. He just references my friend who, in reference to the handler. But he doesn't mention him by name. Do you have any, any, did you know that? And do you have any theories? I'm not at all surprised. They kept their names quiet. They okay, that was my theory. Oh, yeah. No, 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 no talking. Nope, nope, nope. Can't do it. No, so in the in the memoir, he mentions Armin Garo by name, but Garo had long since passed away when he wrote the memoir. So there was no fear of disclosing this guy, and so he, my that was my theory is that he was protecting Shahan's identity because Shahan lived to be like he lived till the eighties or nineties. Ninety nine. Ninety nine. All right. Well, I know that Shahan also. Shahan had a falling out with the ARF. And so that was a, some, there are other people who have that theory that, that the ARF actually got a hold of this memoir and changed it and kicked and took Shahan out of it, et cetera. No, no. Okay. They did not speak of, of these people. They did not. I mean, let's face that it. That makes remember, sense. Um, I think that, that Aaron kept his files to himself because that was the best way he could protect them. The ARF might have destroyed them, or if they didn't destroy them, they might have given them to somebody that wouldn't have been as careful. Mm. He kept them to keep them safe. So that's my guess. And that's why I think why he think I think he did what he did. He kept them so that his granddaughter could discover them and publish them. <laughs> well, I don't know if he see, this is the thing I, I've been asking myself, did he have any inkling what was going to happen when he died? Did he have any right. idea what, what we would do with this stuff? He must have known my mother would pounce on it. He must have known that we would be eager to read this stuff. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious myself what he would have thought. What, just, would he approve of what, destiny, the, what I've done? Destiny. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, Yes, I would say he would approve. Um, <laughs> I, I have two other questions. The last one will be easy. But uh, one other question that uh, you mentioned something that confirms something that I thought about as well and that I've just in my research, Talat was negotiating. He was meeting with world leaders like he was being harbored safely by the Germans in Berlin and all, and meeting with diplomats and world leaders negotiating for his eventual return to power. And I'm, I think that if Operation Nemesis hadn't found him and, and assassinated him, instead of Ataturk as the founding father of Turkey, it would have been Talat. That's my theory. I don't think it's a theory. I think it's true. I think that he, he had thought that that would happen. That was what he was trying to happen. They were all doing that, all three of them. We're going back into the fray in order to try to reconstruct a reality that they wanted to happen. By the way, initially, Talat was, you know, how can I put this, left to his, to his grave in Germany. It wasn't until the 40s, 1940s, 44, I think. I think it was 43. 43? The, 
the Nazis help f the Nazis facilitate. Yeah, transfer exactly. Remains. When Hitler facilitated moving those remains, and that's not a surprise. That's not, it should not be surprising, put it that way, no surprise there. And that's when you know, the big grave was done and all the fancy, you know, the, the, the you know, the remembrance stuff, the, you know, making the commemoration and the fanfare of that, of his grave, that's when that was done. Um, so, you know, who knows? Who knows what would have happened sooner? But that's certainly what they were going for. I think that's right. Right. All right. Final question. Um, since this podcast is called Hollywood in History, we spend a lot of time on history, but uh, we like to get movie recommendations from our from our guests. Uh, uh, and it doesn't have to be related. It doesn't have to be related to this, but anything, any kind of movie, your favorite movie, what what do you what do you think we would enjoy? Or what is a movie that you enjoy that you want us to see? Poi yo yo. <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Well, yeah. Um I should probably give this some thought before I I speak because I'm not happy with a lot of the films that I see. Um, luckily, you didn't ask me to comment about the films on Armenian subjects because I don't think any of them have been all that good. Mm. Um, I would like to say some are really good, but I don't think a lot of them are. And, and that's partly why I have hopes so for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, we're going to do this, this thing. Is, this is a, a subject that needs truth, sensitivity, subtlety, and all of the power and mass of film, that, that all the power yeah. and, and focus that film can provide. The power meaning the big stuff and the focus, the close-ups. The, the minute details that you can do in film that that are so important. So, I mean, there are films out there, I can tell you that I like, but I don't think they're going to give you very much information. Oh, no, this is this is just a throwaway. It, it doesn't have to be information. Something you enjoy, unrelated to history. Oh, unrelated to history. Well, um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah, that's a good one. That's that's a good one. How's that? Good. Perfect. I also like um, Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. I don't think I've seen that version. I'll watch that one then. He, he did. He, he went on actually to direct at the Met. So um, he had a, a kind of, of, how can I put this? Um, panoramic and yet intimate view of, mm. of how to move people around, how to, how to get out of them the most important stuff that you, that you really want he did some powerful things for the Met, really fantastic operas. So uh, you wouldn't think he would go from Shakespeare to opera, but it actually worked really well, really well. Well, Marion, thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for taking this time with us. And uh, it won't be the last. It's the first, but it won't be the last. Um, Armin, do you have any other, any other questions? No, that's it. At some point, maybe we can talk about the actual enterprise of, of Nemesis. Yeah. You know, what they did, why they did it, how they did it, you know. Let's do that. It, it could be. Let's make that our next. It could be useful. Our next time. It could be fun stuff to talk about because that's. Absolutely. That's the, that's the stuff that you'd, you'd end up putting in a movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the action yeah. stuff. Yeah, in who fact. Did, who did what? Let's, what? let's put it on the calendar and focus on that next time. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. It was fun. Thank you. Good to see you. Take care. Good to see Good you guys. Good to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.